chapter 2 of Love of the God Man by James Steinberg. Love of the God Man being Dala Vananda, Adidas Samraj, or he was known as Dar Kalki at the time of writing. What a wonder! What a wonder this great one is. I marvel in the great one more than you because you do not witness its miracle. You do not see the great one. I can understand your reluctance to be submitted to the great one because you do not see what I see. But I have been sifted into this wonder since eternal time. I am just that one, the Great One, sitting here as this body, talking to you. I am God, and there is not the slightest doubt in me. The doubt in you is your own perversion, and this is the course of my teaching. Thus, I am here to teach you out of this unhappiness. Poor me. I will be laughing about this for countless ages, as I have been laughing about it since eternal time. Everyone hears the truth. Everyone receives the shock of God. Everyone. There is no being from the mosquito to man who does not receive the shock of divine intervention. All beings know it. All beings experience it. It is given to everyone. Grace is given to all beings eternally in all worlds, visible and invisible. This acknowledgement is enough to make you a bhakta, a lover, a devotee. Faith, the love response to being itself, is the great force in all the worlds. It has ridden out my entire life. I am riding the invisible horse you cannot see. Chapter 2. Who is the Satguru? The Identity and Ecstatic Speech of Sridhar Kalki Who Sridhar Kalki is will always be the supreme secret disclosed by divine revelation. When he is standing before you, his feet planted on the ground like pillars that hold up the earth, his face shining with divine radiance, his eyes moist with blessings and radiating infinite love, your mind falls apart. The breath is overwhelmed with the passion of his divine aliveness, his complete sacrifice just to be, just to give himself to your vision. Your entire life and everything you have ever known is made new again by the mere sight of him. How then to describe in words that supreme condition in which Dar Kalki lives? How to communicate about that brilliance that Sadhguru Dala Vananda is, the source of all speech? How to make clear to another what must be witnessed and cannot be accepted based on mere report. Based on the incarnation and instruction of Sridhar Kalki, 
This chapter will explore the supreme identity of the divinely self-realized God-man and the distinctions between such a one and the many other great individuals who teach and serve various levels of spiritual instruction. For in understanding the different types of gurus, we can better use the gifts they bring. Ultimately, the identity of the Sat Guru is revealed in his ecstatic speech, an open conduit of divine inspiration. 1. Who is a Sat Guru? The Sanskrit term Guru has become a universal word, word, crossing language barriers worldwide. However, it has come to be used so casually that its connection with the long tradition of the transmission of genuine spirituality is often obscured. Western dictionaries now routinely include this word, and even they point out that the word is often used derisively. This is one more sign of the popular adolescence of our times, with its refusal to acknowledge the superior man and its insistence that all are equal. In terms of political and social freedom, there is no doubt that all are entitled to be regarded as equal. But it is just as clear that in terms of wisdom and maturity, there are great differences between men. To dispute the superiority of the great realisers in spiritual matters and the need for us to resort to them is, to use a metaphor penned by Darkalki, like the earth arguing about the necessity that it revolve about the sun. It has been one of the graceful services of Sri Gurudev Dalavananda to be that divine voice calling all to be restored to a right and honourable relationship to our greatest sources of help. The word guru itself is composed of two contrasting syllables, gu meaning the gunas or that congealed matter that is, darkness, and ru signifying the action of destruction or removal as fire destroys. Ru is often is also often described as light. Putting these two syllables together, the guru is the one who releases or redirects the disciple from darkness, non-truth, to light, truth itself. The true guru is the dispeller of darkness or ignorance. In common usage, the word also means heavy or weighty, pointing to the guru as a substantial or prestigious personage. Obviously, such a one cannot be taken for granted or related to casually. Heartmaster Dalavananda has pointed out that in the Eastern Indian tradition, any teacher or imparter of knowledge might be called a guru. Traditionally, the mother is regarded as the first guru because she bears and feeds the child. The second guru is the father who introduces the child to the world. The next guru is the teacher of ordinary knowledge or the traditional religious ways. For a high caste individual in traditional India, instruction with the guru begins after the initiation or second birth, known as the Upanayana ceremony, the major rite in the childhood of an individual, which usually occurs between eight and ten years of age. Henceforth, Traditionally, the child lives with the guru and is instructed by him in the sacred ceremonies and scriptures. This system of education is known as the guru kula, the guru's family. The teacher assumes great intimacy with his or her disciples and full responsibility for them, and they in their turn are devoted to him obediently. The disciples serve the Kula Pati, or head of the Guru Kula. 
when not engaged in their studies in a variety of ways. Archie typically, you know, archetypally, they bring him wood early each morning for his sacred fire. The Kulapati, on his part, is entrusted with full care for his Brahmakaras, or students of Brahma, God, and their practical welfare, as well as their right moral and religious upbringing. After a traditional 12 years of studentship, such formal instruction ends, and the Brahmakaras typically become householders or adult family members in Indian society. In some cases, they decide to instead dedicate the remainder of their lives to renunciate spiritual practice. Although there were many great individuals in the history of Indian Gurukulas, generally called Rishis or men of wisdom, often the Kulapatis were simply teachers proficient in the traditional scriptures and the ancient orally transmitted rituals. They were bearers of the ordinary heritage of the Hindu tradition, but were not necessarily instructors relative to the greatest affairs of spiritual life. So in the natural hierarchy of the teachers, of teachers, beyond the ordinary Kulapati, there were many other types of gurus who, to one degree or another, were alive as transmitters of the divine reality. These teachers are described in many different writings within Hinduism in various ways according to the predilection of any particular school or tradition. A typical account is this passage from the Kula Nava Tantra, the most commonly quoted of the translated Hindu Tantras. Many are the gurus like lamps in house and house. But rare is the guru who lights up all like the sun. Many are the gurus who are proficient to the utmost in Vedas and Sastras, but rare is the guru he has attained to the supreme truth. Many are the gurus on earth who give what is other than the self, but rare is the guru in the worlds who brings to light the Atman. He is the guru by whose very contact there flows the supreme Ananda. The intelligent man shall choose such a one as the guru and no other. Darkalki in his teaching revelation has clarified the entire spiritual process and made plain the real functional distinctions between various types of gurus. The distinctions described by Dark Halki are a necessary place to begin in understanding the guru-devotee relationship because they clarify the confusing variety of traditional descriptions cut through today's widespread misconceptions and conflicting notions about the guru devotee relationship and give us an overview of the differences between the fullest realizers of the supreme truth, the great teachers of various degrees, and the many other good men and women who teach and instruct. Dark Holke is in a unique position to bring the instruction because he has realized the entire divine process in his own body mind because he, free of binding attachment to any particular traditional way, has appeared in a time when the esoteric spiritual traditions have become accessible to all, even via paperback books and videotapes. I will discuss more fully the service he has done in clarifying what he calls the one great tradition of mankind in Chapter 5. In brief, he has comprehensively and compassionately reviewed and commented upon the essentials of all the teachings and points of view of all philosophical, religious, spiritual and transcendental paths. Because of his most perfect realisation of the truth of all ways 
and his divinely given service to clarify the truth and principles of all of them. He is the master of this great tradition as a whole, rather than any particular tradition or way. Darkhalki has, for all of mankind and for all time, made plain how the entire spiritual process works through a description of that process in seven developmental stages of life, which follow naturally upon one another. Based on that model, he has shown how each traditional way fits into the whole. Sri Gurudev Dalavananda has named his masterwork on the great tradition, the basket of tolerance, a guide to perfect understanding of the one and great tradition of mankind. Because a right understanding of the relationships between all of, tra of the traditions inherently draws forth tolerance and mutual respect. In the basket of tolerance, Art Master Dalavananda clarifies the range of individuals who serve as gurus. He says, in the great tradition of mankind, teachers are sometimes called gurus, smelled, spelled with a small g. Such gurus are not men or women of realization, but they instruct others in various secular and sacred arts, crafts and sciences. In order to equip them for the ordinary human pursuit and struggle. And some of these gurus may also constantly remind their students of the sacred itself. However, in the great tradition of mankind, the sacred ordeal itself is the providence, is the province of teachers or actually realizers of samadhi. Of these, there are gurus spelled with a capital G, who, in the context of any or all of the fourth, fifth and sixth stages of life, have at one time or another experienced samadhi and who, therefore, can, in the context of their own stage or degree of realisation, give first-hand guidance, including revelatory explanations, and in some cases a degree of spiritual transmission, relative to the techniques, processes, stages, obstacles and goals of the self-transcending way. And beyond these gurus, there are satgurus, also often referred to by the simpler reference guru, or those who are presently and constantly in samadhi in the context of any or all of the fourth, fifth and sixth stages of life, and especially or in the ultimate case, in the context of the seventh stage of life, and who are unique in their ability to fully transmit their own uniquely developed wisdom, spiritual power of realization, and in the greatest of cases, also their own state of realization or samadhi directly to others. Thus, the first two types of gurus are those not founded in constant spiritual realization. The first type, ordinary gurus, are not themselves great practitioners and they do not transmit spiritual realization at all but they simply instruct. The second type gurus with a capital G are those who have had an experience of some greater state of realization, but since they are not fixed in the samadhi itself, can only guide others to some degree. The next type of guru is the sat guru. The Sanskrit term sat refers to the divine reality or pure being that is absolute and eternal consciousness. The Satguru teacher teaches not about the ordinary, but about this great truth or reality. Sri Gurudev Dalavananda very specifically uses the term Satguru to mean an individual who is permanently, always presently founded in Samadhi. Even amongst Satgurus, there are distinctions to be made. In terms of realization, such Satgurus may be in the fourth, fifth, sixth or seventh stage of life. And in terms of transmission, such Satgurus 
may be either those who simply transmit spiritual power or those greatest sat gurus who transmit their actual state or samadhi. As Darkalki has made clear, to be in perpetual samadhi is a great affair. It is to be permanently in the bliss state of one of the advanced or ultimate stages of life. Few beings in history have attained such realization. In the spiritual traditions, we mostly hear descriptions of those who write during a brief experience or who who give a description from memory of such an experience. Only very rarely do we hear of great sat gurus who are always in such a condition. The sat guru of the fourth stage of life is always demonstrating love of the divine, always totally absorbed in love of God, embracing the divine and the descended fullness of the divine, and perhaps experiencing the initial awakening of higher spiritual or mystical energies. He is constantly speaking of or absorbed in divine grace. The Satguru of the fifth stage of life is always in yogic samadhi, always immersed in the ascended spiritual energies. Swami Nichananda, Swami Muktananda, Swami Rudrananda, Sai Baba Shirdi, and Rang Abbot Ut are examples of great fifth and fourth or fifth stage Satgurus who served Sri Gurudev Dalavananda in the cause of his sadhana. The sixth stage Satguru is always founded in the bliss of the heart itself, the feeling of being, which transcends the rising and falling energies of the circle, the ascending and descending circle of energies of the body-mind. This is the domain of great sages such as Brahmagna Ma and Sadguru Gunananda, but there is a tremendous distinction between these and the seventh stage Sadguru. <coughs> 2. The Hridaya Samata Sadguru to designate the greatest type of Satguru, Dalkalki has created the term the Hridaya Samata Satguru. Hridaya is the Sanskrit term for heart, and here it refers to the full seventh stage realization, the realization or siddhi of the heart. The Sanskrit term Samata means adapted, fit, proper, qualified, suitable, good able to, entitled, having power over anyone. As used in the spiritual traditions of India, the word Samata refers to a Satguru who has the full spiritual power to liberate his or her devotee. The Samata Satguru has complete power in this regard over any object or purpose in the manifest or unmanifest worlds. He is so fully adapted, fit or qualified for this blessing or liberating work that he is a match for any obstruction to the spiritual process in his devotee or in the world. The Samatha Satguru's service to his devotee extends to every aspect of the devotee's life providing the living means to turn it to the divine. Traditionally, it has always been understood that the Samatha Satguru has the power to communicate his very state to his fully prepared devotee. Narasimha Swami, the popularizer of the modern Indian saint Shirdi Sai Baba, describes the term Samatha Satguru in the book Life of Sai Baba. Another classification of gurus is based on powers and methods of the guru. The guru who teaches something secular or religious is merely called guru. He who teaches about God or sat is called sat guru. He who uses all his siddhis and superior powers to carry 
the Sisa, Sisya disciple, right up to the goal, is called Samata Sadguru. Ramandas Guru to Shivaji and Sai Baba of Shirdi belong to the class of Samata Sadgurus. Now Simha Swami also describes the powers of the Samata Sadguru in this excerpt from How Do Masters Redeem Devotees in the book The Wondrous Saint Sai Baba. These Samata Sadgurus, with the vast powers, knowledge and bliss of the Supreme, proceed to deal with individual jivas, souls, and help them out of their involution to evolve into the Supreme Being. Samatas like Sai Baba are called Samatas because of the vast, nay, unlimited power, wisdom and bliss, and they are called Satgurus because they appear in order to act as the guru for individual jivas to lead them into the sat or supreme. The powers of the samatas may, to a superficial view, appear like the feats of a thought reader, magician or necromancer. Necromancer. But there are unmistakable differences between these two sets of powers in respect to their origin, their nature or limits, the manner of exercise and the purpose or motive of such exercise. The magician and others of his like acquire their power and exercise it with great effort and its exercise is within definite limits of time, space, etc., and the purpose of the exercise may be either sordid or, at any rate, clearly personal. The Samatha, on the other hand, has not to work for his, the powers. The powers come as part of his realisation and perfection, and exercise of his powers is not the result of effort. These powers are not limited to any particular sort or class, as even Ashta Siddhas the traditional eight powers realised by yoga are limited in comparison with the samatas. The purpose of the samatas exercise is pure mercy for the jiva, whose spiritual advance is distinctly furthered thereby. The title samata is used in reference to many great sat gurus including Sai Baba Shirdi and Akalkot Maharaj, who, has, who was known as Sri Swami Samarth, as well as to the medieval Maha, Maharashtran Saint Ramdas. However, a distinction must be made between the seventh stage or divinely enlightened Samadha Satguru and individuals such as Sai Baba, who are functioning in the four, fifth or sixth stages of life. In the case of full realizers, the siddhas or powers with which they bless are the result of their full seventh stage enlightenment. And these siddhas are the communication of Hiraya's shakti, or the power of the heart, or reality itself, rather than the communication of a lesser realization. It would be wrong to imagine that, that Hridaya Samatha Satgurus are common. Dalkalki is such a one, but I do not know of any other now alive. The greatest adepts of the past may have been such beings, but we have no genuine way to tell. It should be borne in mind that the purpose of making these distinctions is to be able to understand and acknowledge who any fully realised God-man truly is, and to distinguish him or her from those whose function is of a different type. There is a tendency to trivialise the great tradition by assuming that all teachers are the same, all traditions are the same, and that therefore all practitioners are practising the same thing. Likewise, the great process of realisation is trivialised by the assumption 
that because great practitioners have on occasion realized the truth, divine self-realization can be achieved through a few weeks or months of applied effort. As Sridhar Kalki explained, has commented, adepts almost never appear and real practitioners are very rare. That is the way it has always been and the way it still is. People talk as if there are adepts all over the country, as if there are thousands of them. There are not even thousands of real practitioners. People who are not even real practitioners, practitioners are famous for their spirituality. This is an Alice in Wonderland world. It is not real. That is why the teaching is so necessary, why the truth is of such great consequence. The truth is hardly understood at all, and the real implications of spiritual wisdom are not grasped. Even in the optimum circumstance of the traditional setting, it took years and years to develop a disciple, and there were very few disciples. Look back at the history of the traditions and the people who were associated with adepts, about whose realisation you have some certainty. How many adepts were fathered by other adepts? How many adepts produced one or more other adepts, even in the optimum circumstances that pertained in the traditional setting? The Bodily Location of Happiness, page 20. Therefore, the appearance of the Hridayasamata Satguru is an extraordinarily rare event. The devotees of Hridayasamata Satguru Dalavananda have seen over and over again that he is alive with every kind of spiritual power which he uses when necessary to serve his liberating work. The following Leela, told by Ben Fujit, provides a glimpse of Dark Alki's unlimited spiritual power, which is alive in every dimension of existence. It illustrates not only Dark Kalki's mastery of the elemental world, but also his constant service to his devotees. In this case, Ben, in the midst of every action. During the summer of 1979, I was a caretaker at the Mountain Retention Sanctuary. It had been a very hot summer with a number of forest fires in the surrounding country. On this particular day in September, I noticed a small tuft of smoke down the canyon. It looked like it was very close to our property. I immediately ran to the nearest car and raced down the canyon. A fire could be seen going up over a ridge to the northwest. This was an ominous location, practically inaccessible to firefighting equipment due to the rough terrain. It was also in a direct line with the outer sanctuary. Seeing that the sanctuary was threatened by this already out of control fire, I jumped into the car and raced back. I had the fire department notified, then ran out to the back of the sanctuary where I had sent a few men with hand tools to see what they could do. By now the smoke had grown to a large cloud. This was obviously a big fire. I had run about three quarters of a mile toward the fire to check out the extent of the blaze when I received a call on my walkie-talkie to meet Hartmaster Dar at the Sanctuary Zoo as he wanted to ride out to the fire on horseback. I ran back calling requests and orders over the walkie-talkie in preparation for his ride. I found myself in a frenzy by the time I got to the zoo. I hastily saddled the horses. Adrenaline was coursing through my body like never before. I was very much afraid for our sanctuary. 
the area that was immediately threatened by the fire meant far more to me than simply outlying trails and manzanita bushes. It was a potent holy site at the Mountain of Attention Sanctuary, Red Sitting Man, an area where I had spent many hours meditating and serving. I knew this site had spiritual significance and, in, and, then, and that it was extremely important that it not burn. And then, of course, there was the obvious threat to the residences, holy sites and communion halls at the heart of the sanctuary. As Hartmaster Dar approached the horses, his fierce de determination and concern for the sanctuary were obvious to me, but he was also completely calm. His simultaneous intensity and freedom immediately drew me out of my fearfulness. As we mounted the horses, I wondered exactly where we were going, not remotely expecting what was to unfold. As soon as we began riding down the back road, a fire engine careened around the corner behind us and turned on its siren to alert us. The horses bolted, not about to be caught by this screaming machine. I could feel Hartmaster Dar's equanimity as I held on for dear life. The truck finally outran us and the horses relaxed their mad gallop. We rode on to find a spot from which to view the fire. Sri Gurudev was dissatisfied with the distant vantage points I took him to, finally asking to get close to the fire. I took him out through the outer sanctuary to the spot where I had been earlier, but still he wanted to get much closer to the fire. I told him there was an old fire road that would take us right to the fire but I was hesitant to go there, feeling I should not take him into such a dangerous situation. I warned him that the horses would probably refuse to get close to the fire because of all the smoke. But this was the route he wanted to explore, and so we made our way up the steep, overgrown fire road. I cautioned him again about the horses, feeling my own apprehension growing. As we made our way over the ridge, it looked as though we were riding into a different world. The atmosphere was thick with smoke. The ground and trees were red with borate fire retardant, and planes were continuing to drop fire retardant right over us. Once again, I cautioned Hartmaster Dar about the horses, as it was obvious to me we were approaching the head or lead of the fire. He simply replied, don't worry about it. We wove through the trees toward the roar of the blaze. The wind was coming up and fanning the flames. Spot fires burned on either side of us. The main part of the fire was roaring through the more dense forest directly ahead. I had finally found the right spot. This was where he wanted to be righted the path of the fire. I was afraid. It seemed to me that we could easily be trapped by the, by the fire. It was moving so quickly. The spot fires behind us could seal off our escape. The horses might bolt. My body was again charged with adrenaline, pumping wild, terrified energy. Once more, I warned Hartmaster Dar of the possible danger. He looked at me intensely and asked if I was frightened, and I told him honestly, yes. His response was, why do you think I wanted to come up here? I have to look the fire in the eye. Hartmaster Dar's communication was so full of force that it was incomprehensible to me. I could feel that his complete free and uncompromised attention was on the blazing fire. In that instant, 
I was relieved by my fear, of my fear. Suddenly, instead of feeling overwhelmed by terror, I was released into love, and I only wanted to contemplate my spiritual master. Heart Master Dar then turned toward the flames, and he moved within thirty yards or so of the advancing blaze. The roar and force of the fire was amazingly powerful. Flames exploded at the sides of two enormous trees directly in front of us, as if to confront Heartmaster Dar. I could feel this great force of nature over against the master life. I also noticed to my amazement that the horses were completely calm, almost as if they were out grazing in a pasture. They were obviously feeling Heart Master Dar's calming influence as much as I was. I was sitting to the side and slightly behind Heart Master Dar, watching him regard the fire. The magnitude of the fire appeared to increase significantly as the wind came up suddenly and fire engulfed the area directly in front of us. Facing the fire's new rush of force and fury, Heartmaster Dar sat completely still in his saddle. His only movements were the spontaneous emotions of his face and hands in various mudras, spiritual gestures, very much the same as I had seen many times during formal darshan or meditation occasions. I felt him radiate divine fire in the face of that forest fire. Whatever else he might have been doing, Art Master Dar was radiating the most benign and yet fierce and commanding power I had ever felt. After what must have been only a few moments, although time seemed to be suspended and warped, the fire receded and then died down. The winds stopped. The consuming power of this fire seemed to be bowing down to Heartmaster Dar. I am sure that it is difficult for the reader to picture this moment, but that fire had been transformed. I can only say that it was a mysterious and extraordinary moment to see and feel the great adept change the course and magnitude of a raging forest fire. I sat still in mindless wonder. Heart Master Dar then turned back toward the sanctuary, moving slowly through the trees, stopping to talk for a time. We looked over the scene. The fire was still moving, but much more slowly now and not directly toward the sanctuary boundary. When we arrived back at the main sanctuary complex, I was surprised to find all Heart Master Dar's belongings and all our files and records library books, religious art and machines being packed into waiting vans and trucks. Apparently no one had remembered my instructions to wait until we returned before deciding to evacuate. Heartmaster Dar just laughed as he dismounted and sat down on the steps of his residence amidst a sea of packed boxes. He kidded me about our trip up to the fire and teasingly told everyone. Ben was so afraid, he almost shit in his pants. I always tend to withdraw in the face of anything that is fearful to me. Sadhguru Da has pointed this out to me a number of times of, over the years and he would use this event for years to remind me of my tendencies and how I must cut through them. During this incident, he has simply drawn me out of my position of fear and agitation into trust and the capability to love and serve. I felt through him what it is to move in this world, even in the most dangerous circumstances, as a free man. Later that evening, we rode out again to survey the neighbouring areas. Then Heart Master Dar asked me to call the neighbours and make sure everyone was all right. In doing so, 
I found out that although about 1,000 acres had been burned, no buildings had been lost, no one had been injured, and even our neighbours' orchards had only been slightly scorched. A few days later I walked back up to the spot where Hartmaster Dar had worked with the fire, reflecting on all that had occurred there. The area was still smeared with red borat dust, borat dust and ash. The strong smell of smoke lingered. I thought about how confounding and amazing the whole event had been, feeling humbled and full of love. The fire, I discovered, had stopped short of the sanctuary boundary by only a foot. The following leader shows the kind of transformations that Dark Arkis' extraordinary accomplishing power effects each day in the lives of his devotees. It is told by Meg Krentz, who serves the process of retreats in Sri Guru Devdar Levananda's physical company at Sri Levanandashram. She describes a three-week retreat of Susan Carroll, a devotee from Lake County, California. Such stories are legend in the blessing company of this great Hridaya Sadmata Satguru. When Susan first arrived on retreat in late March of 1990, Sri noticed that she seemed particularly stiff and, and unable to make a devotional response or a feeling response to, in Darshan occasions. Her fellow retreatants showed many of the characteristic signs of devotional response and boldly pervasion by Darkarka's blessing power shown externally in all kinds of rapturous bodily movements, careers and mudras, changes in the breath, such as spontaneous rapid breathing and retention of the breath, weeping, shouting or simply sitting in a deep and silent swoon. But Susan had not been capable of opening to receive his blessing transmission in this way, and she felt very self-conscious about her lack of responsiveness to her own Satguru. Sri Gurudev extended his helping regard by asking about her practice of the way of the heart and her previous background. Susan responded by confessing that she did feel frozen at the emotional level. She had been a serious practitioner of Zen Buddhism for 18 years previous to her participation in the way of the heart and the particular form of Zen practice she had taken up involved the strict controlling of body, emotion and mind in the attempt to elicit awakening. Susan also wrote to her heart master that she had not been rightly prepared to make use of this Zen practice which is most basically a practice of the sixth stage of life and that because of her attempt to practice beyond her level of preparedness, her Zen meditation practice had reinforced a basic tendency to be dissociative and unfeeling. The results were plainly clear to her in her inability to be fully emotionally associated in all, in all her relationships, including her primary relationship to her own Satguru. Sridhar Khaki immediately began a very direct and personal purifying work with Susan, sending her detailed instructions about the errors she had fallen into in her approach to Zen practice. Sri Gurudev's Shri, Shri essential calling to Susan was as follows. You must begin at the beginning and you must deal with the foundation of practice. You must truly establish a devotional response to me and you must develop a meditative life on that basis. Thus you must unlearn many rigid patterns 
and the habits of strategic and ego-based meditation through your devotional response to me. You must establish a truly self-surrendering, self-forgetting and self-transcending way of life. The key word then is feeling. You have established rigid patterns relative to feeling and attention. And the results of this can be seen in your bodily, in you bodily. You must allow the restoration of life in your body and in your feeling. You must submit your attention to feeling me and to a responsive and feeling life altogether. You cannot fruitfully practice a stage or level of practice that is greater than your present level of responsibility. Presumably, there were positive results on your association with Zen, as there were also some limitations. In any case, you must now you now must begin to practice on the real basis of your clear and present level of self responsibility. You should begin with the feeling heart and be released from these egoic strategies through real and true and consistent devotion to me. Despite this help, however, Susan found it difficult to relinquish her habit of guarding herself emotionally, and she continued to suffer a feeling of non-responsiveness to her Satguru, locked in the thinking mind and not allowing the love blissful invasion of his spirit blessing, and she saw other retreatants experiencing that she saw other retreatants experiencing. She went to the last scheduled darshan occasion of her retreat, still afraid that she would have to leave Sri Levanandashram, unable to express her devotion to her own heart master. Susan later spoke about what happened when the retreatants were suddenly called to indefinable Dalkalka's residence in the village of devotees. Susan says, I was one of the last ones to leave the giving coat. While hurrying to Indefinable, I was filled with both apprehension and joy. In spite of being overwhelmed by my own cold heart, I felt a deep desire to be free of his clutches. When I arrived at Indefinable, I was stopped short by the most beautiful sight of my entire life. Trigurdabdala Vananda was simply sitting on the steps of the porch. He did not even have a chair. He was looking down and he was very, very beautiful. We were only a few feet away from him. By the time I got there, several of the women retreatants were already seated and already weeping. Sri Gurudev was simply looking happy and sublimed by my friend's responses. I am not quite sure how it happened, but pretty soon I was sobbing non-stop, and it was definitely, and it definitely was not my doing. I had not been able to feel anything like such emotion. Then I found myself on my back, having deep breathing kriyas, which I had always and envied others for having. My friends told me later that I was beginning to let go of my rigid and unfeeling control of everything. Sri Gurudev looked over at me with a smile on his face. By now, my mighty doubting mind was basically rent asunder. I sat back up as soon as I could because I wanted to see my beloved Satguru. By this time, almost everyone had been unhinged. Devotees were praising Sri Gurudev as the Jagad Guru, the Great One, and as Dal Kalki. We were being drawn into a much more profound understanding of who he is than had occurred in previous darshans. I started saying and feeling Da, and this mantra took me over. Sri Gurudev Shakti, spiritual force, was coursing through my body and I became riveted to the spot. I looked up at him. The space where we sat with him had become motionless and timeless. 
He was the fire and I was vapour floating above and all around him. He was doing and giving everything. I feel he gave me these experiences not for their own sake but to draw me out and help me feel past the incredible barricade of fear I had been so heavily identified with. I was finally able to feel my always already present love for him. Through his grace, I was able to partake of the feast he is always giving and to celebrate that in the company of my friends as well. I was unbelievably happy. At the end, he motioned for us to come up on the porch to receive Farsad, Prasad. I saw no possibility of getting from the ground to the porch steps since I was still completely charged with his Shakti force. My body, and particularly my hands, were literally twisted with his blissful force. But somehow I managed to crawl forward and bow before him. My hands were still rigid claws, stiff with force, and I was unable to open them to receive his prasad. This was not a problem for Sri Gurudev. He compassionately opened my hands with his own and placed the prasad in them. I backed off the porch and felt and fell in a heap of grateful, full-feeling prostration on the ground. When I sat up once again to gaze upon the most beautiful sight in the universe, Sri Jagad Guru Dalavananda stood up and moved into the house. Such stories of Hiridasa Matasat Guru Dalavananda illustrate his mastery and blessing help in every dimension of the lives of his devotees. Here's Sri Gurudev sitting on the steps. Da, da.